preparing to live stream. Good evening, everyone. How is everyone doing? I hope you are all safe and healthy as you join us in tonight's webinar entitled Vox, a multidisciplinary discussion on the proposed construction of the mega vaccination facility in the Nayong Filipino grounds. My name is Frank, and together with our organizers, we welcome you all. I hope you already had an early dinner um, because I'm sure it's going to be quite an interesting night for all of us. This event is organized and presented to you by the College of Architecture from the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and the Environmental Landscapes Studio Laboratory. This is also in partnership with the Philippine Association of Landscape Architects, UP Circle of Landscape Architecture Students, UP Department of Philosophy, and the Philippine Bar Association. It is also presented as Rex Talks by the Research and Extension Office of the UP College of Architecture. We are streaming live via Zoom, the Environmental Landscape Studio Laboratory YouTube page, and various Facebook pages such as the UP College of Architecture, Official Pala page, UP Department of Philosophy, and the Philippine Bar Association pages. So, tonight, to open our webinar, may we call on Dr. Grace C. Ramos, Dean of the UP College of Architecture, to give her welcome remarks. Good evening and welcome to this online forum, which has been organized in line with the UP College of Architecture's commitment to be of service to the nation through various academic fora, with extension as one of the three avenues of service, along with teaching and research, we are now reaching out to the community of professionals, students, researchers, non-academics, stakeholders in general to allow a very multi-directional flow of exchange of ideas. With current issues at the core of discussions, we hope to be able to explore possibilities of understanding different viewpoints, leading to very fresh strategies that direct at the public interest. Of course, the goal is not to fully resolve conflicts, I guess, because there will always be many sides to an issue, but we would want to be able to gain better understanding of various perspectives. We have for our resource persons, experts from different disciplines coming from the realms of landscape architecture, urban design, biology, there's medicine, there's law, philosophy, and so we are sure to hear a very multifaceted discussions tonight. With both professional and academic lenses, we look forward to hosting nothing less but a very vibrant discussion that will surely lead to different realizations at the end of the session. We therefore invite you to engage with very open and eager minds. Let's all learn and enjoy the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Ramos, for welcoming uh, our audience to, tonight. So um, to give context to the discussion for tonight, uh, which will happen in, in just a few minutes, um, allow me to share a, a few slides first to give context to tonight's discussion. Okay, let me share my screen. All right. All right, so um, 
again, we welcome each and every one of you to VOX, a multidisciplinary discussion on the proposed construction of the mega vaccination facility in the Nayong Filipino grounds. Now, let's talk about the Nayong Filipino Foundation. What is it? And perhaps you can take a, mem a trip down memory lane and perhaps remember some memories of what you remember about Nayong Filipino. So according to the website, the Nayong Filipino Foundation is a government-owned and controlled corporation or what we can say as GOCC that was established in the 70s through the creation of the presidential decree number 37. It's well known for the park, but according to NPF's mandate, it is to initiate research and take on development projects in the field of social sciences and humanities. In addition to this role, it also has uh, a mandate to establish parks and recreation centers for tourism promotion. But where is it exactly? If you search it on Google, or look it up on Google Maps, you will see different Nayong Filipino locations. One is in Pasay, one is in Clark, while one is in Paranaque. But when you browse through published directives um, from the president and other government-issued documents, you'll see its history in terms of location, size, and land typology under varying administrations. Basically, you will see that it was developed in Pasay with a 47 hectare of land, but 30 years later, a portion of it was transferred to the Manila International Airport Authority or MIAA. While maintaining the remaining land in Pasay, Nayong Pilipino was replicated in Clark for an exposition. And by 2007, the Nayong Pilipino property was relocated to Paranaque. With the full transition, the Pasay property was fully turned over to the MIAA. So, where is Nayong Pilipino now? Without facilities on site, the Nayong Pilipino continued to, to function to fulfill its main vision amidst controversies. After the alleged $1.5 billion resort project, President Duterte appointed new officials by 2019. And it was during 2019 that the proposal for a cultural park and creative hub should have commenced. But sadly, COVID happened. All budgets from various agencies with pending projects were channeled to the government's pandemic response. And around September of 2020, the Mega Quarantine Center was inaugurated. And now it is being operated by the Armed Forces of the Philippines. It was also during the pandemic that a, a lot of people realized the necessity of public transportation, pedestrian-centered developments, even bike lanes for that matter. So Nayong Pilipino, in line with this, announced their flagship project for the year 2021 coined as Sambayanihan Project. This project is um, described to be a creation of an urban forest to transform the NPF property as a platform for citizen-led biodiversity conservation. With this proposal of an urban forest park, another proposal surfaced. This is the mega vaccination facility, one that was proposed by the Rezon Group to DOT for NPF's consideration. They are to construct a temporary vaccination center in the vacant lot. As you can see, this was actually posted in the Department of Tourism uh, Tourism's Facebook page in 20, April of 2021. So now we're left with a centralized plan, one that claims it will be able to vaccinate around 10,000 to 12,000 people per day for a duration of a one-year operation, as stated by DOT on several media presses, right? And these are some references that you can check out. Okay. So, um, 
interesting background. So to share their perspective on tonight's topic, we are actually very, very fortunate to have with us not just three, not four, but five experts of their respective fields. So I'm sure that we're going to have a lot of exchanges and discussion for tonight. After which, we will open the floor to your questions, which will be followed by a synthesis. But first, I would like to take this time and opportunity to introduce to you our five speakers. He has experience in litigation of cases up to the Philippine Supreme Court, which is currently the landmark jurisprudence in intellectual property, corporation, and remedial laws. Acquiring a bachelor's degree in education and law, at the University of the Philippines, he obtained his master's in law at the Indiana University Maurer School of Law. A member of the editorial board of the Philippine Law Journal, we have with us attorney Rico V. Domingo. Our next speaker earned his Bachelor of Science in Biology from the University of the Philippines, Visayas, and his Doctor of Medicine at the University of the Philippines, Manila. He earned a Doctor of Philosophy in Medical Science from Nagasaki University and a postgraduate diploma in product research and development to meet public health needs from the same university and Thammasat University. Now the Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs and a Professor of Microbiology at UP Visayas. Let's all welcome, we, ha we have as our next speaker, um, Dr. Philip, Philip Ian P. Padilla. Next, she is a multi-award winning doctor and academician both here in the Philippines and abroad. Graduating from UP College of Medicine, she is both a pharmacologist and an obstetrician gynecologist. She is also a member of the Philippine Obstetrical and Gynecological Society and the Philippine Society for the Study of Trophoblastic Diseases. A firm advocate of women's wellness and maternal and child health, say hello to Dr. Maria Stephanie Faye S. Cagayan. He is a multi-awarded designer in architecture, landscape architecture, and urban design. He has been sharing his abilities and knowledge to the design industry, initially as an apprentice under Architect Concho and National Artist Ildefonso Santos before form forming PDAA Partners. Getting his degree in Architecture and Landscape Architecture from UP Diliman, he finished his Master's in Urban Design from the National University of Singapore. His passions include historic conservation and public open spaces. A published author and writer, we have landscape architect Paolo G. Alcazarin as our fourth speaker. She is currently an assistant professor at the University of the Philippines Institute of Biology. She graduated from Manchester Metropolitan University with a PhD in conservation ecology in 2013. Among her interests are wildlife biology, ornithology, and bird frugivores ecology. We have with us Dr. Carmela P. Española as our last presenter for the night. Without further ado, let us now start with the first um, discussion or presentation by Attorney Domingo. Attorney Domingo, please. Good evening. Thank you, Professor Franklin and uh, Dr. Ramos and uh, Dean uh, Napi for your very interesting uh, discussion. <clears throat> I have to pardon myself uh, for having a very hoarse voice, but I'd like to extend my voice right now. I am supposed to talk to, about the some legal issues that uh, may be involved in this uh, current uh, controversy. And uh, to provide uh, a factual background as well as context to my uh, presentation, which I, I'd like to be very brief on, I'd like to uh, review some of the uh, pertinent or relevant uh, communication between the major players of this uh, dispute. No? Thus, in the memorandum from the Executive Secretary dated May 4, 2021, 
it copies to uh, Secretary Duque, National Task Force uh, for, against COVID, uh, Secretary Carlito Galvez, and the uh, Foundation Executive uh, Director Lucille Karen Malilong Isberto, as well as the Department of Tourism Secretary. The uh, Office of the President directed the uh, Nayon Filipino Foundation to undertake, and I'm, and, and I'm uh, quoting, to undertake any and all acts necessary to allow the DOH or the NTF, meaning the National, uh, National uh, Task Force, to use the NPF property in Paranaque City for COVID-19 intervention measures, particularly a site for vaccination center and or quarantine facility, including issuance of a resolution for such purpose and the execution of the corresponding agreement, okay? So with that uh, directive from the office of the secretary, the uh, executive uh, director of the, N, uh, the National, uh, National uh, Nayong Filipino Foundation responded in a letter and I quote uh, the, the very basic uh, or the uh, primary uh, context of the letter. It says that uh, it, in essence, it says that the Lion Filipino Foundation fully supports efforts to respond to the public health emergency brought about by COVID-19, it allowed the use of its property located at Entertainment City, Paranaque City, as quarantine facility. A quarantine facility operated by the Armed Forces of the Philippines stands on the site of the NPF, is providing assistance to the AFP to improve the landscaping of the quarantine facility to address issues of extreme heat and mosquito infestation. And the Healing Garden and Tree Grove are being designed by NPF to improve the well being and welfare of the patients and the personnel manning the quarantine facility. Then the letter of Executive Director Malilong Isberto said, or continues, the NPF Board of Trustees are also approved the use of the property as a vaccination facility. The NPF management is coordinating with the DOH and the AFP to ensure that the building and the patients are properly protected and they stop operating the quarantine facility. The NPF is also developing a proposal to the DOH for a vaccination in urban forest. So this would be the, the trust of the, uh, of the uh, letter of the executive director at that time. You know? And uh, you have to put this in the context of the uh, proposal of a, a, a private uh, proponent of the uh, vaccination facility within the context, within the, uh, the compound, which is now the Nayong Filipino that we have just seen in the, in the uh, video clip. No? So with this, uh, the uh, NPF indicated that there should be some evaluation of the legal illegal uh, ramifications of the uh, proposed uh, vaccination facility and therefore there should be some evaluation of it. No? Remember that the uh, National uh, Nayong Filipino Foundation is a corporate uh, entity. It is a corporate body and it is under uh, Presidential 37 which is its charter and therefore it is supposed to be uh, the uh, custodian and the and the property custodian of the entire compound and the entire park area. And therefore, even the uh, presidential decree 37 act actually had given the title to the Nayong Filipino Foundation in fee simple of the entire area, okay? So with that in mind, the uh, executive director also posed the question, there are some environmental law issues here uh, given that uh, that uh, the uh, the site, the proposed site, is supposed to be within a certain area that is supposed to be protected by certain laws, you know? particularly uh, the uh, what we call uh, the uh, the uh, Convention on Ramsar. You know? 
As everyone knows, Ramsam Convention or the Ramsam Convention on Wetlands on International Importance is an intergovernmental treaty that provides the framework for nation or national action and international cooperation for conservation and wise use of wetlands and their resources. And therefore, it is within the protected area, meaning the, uh, the, the site uh, adjacent to or close to the uh, proposed uh, vaccination facility, the mega facility, would be very close to it, or if not adjacent immediately to it. No? So there are certain ecosystem issues here. No? For example, in the website of the uh, of the uh, Environmental Natural Resources on the website of Biodiversity Management Bureau, it says that uh, in, in the protected area is situated in the coastal wetland in Manila Bay within the metropolis of Manila and comprising two intercontinented or intercontinented mangrove covered islands, shallow lagoon and coastline. And according to a presidential decree, uh, 2007, the area was designated the site as a critical habitat for survival of threatened restricted range and congregatory species and at least 5,000 individual migratory and resident birds had been recorded at the site, including about 47 migratory species such as the vulnerable Chinese egret or egretta yulopotes and the most important and resident bird species is a vulnerable, what we call and famously call Philippine duck or Anas luzonica, which breeds at the site. So the executive director or the uh, Nayon Filipino Foundation raised some legal as well as the environmental issues no? that up to now have not been addressed properly and uh, regularly by the people concerned or the offices concerned. Hence, to address one of the key questions under discussion in this particular uh, forum, the question is whether the megavax facility construction should not be a question of, would be conflicting options, would be a question of conflicting of options. It is an option between bio, biodiversity rather versus health emergency. Now, my, my take to that or on that would be, it doesn't have to be, no. Because if we only follow the rules of regulations underlying this uh, project, then we should not have any problem. It doesn't have to be a conflict between biodiversity versus health emergency. Because the National Nayong Filipino Foundation is in favor of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, site. But the question is, are we, uh, or are the people concerned that are proposing it following the rules of regulations and the laws that are applicable as well as, well as our international law obligation under the Ramsam Convention? So if we look at the uh, legal matrix of the, uh, of the uh, proposed uh, uh, memorandum or agreement between the parties, the question is, are we going to give the management and the operation of the vaccination facility to a private entity? Given the national, uh, the Nayong Filipino Foundation is actually, as uh, correctly said by uh, the, in the introductory uh, comment of Professor Franklin, it is a GOCC. It is a governmental corporation. Can it enter with a private entity? Okay. And what would be, would it be covered by the uh, general accounting code so that there'll be accountability of whatever funds. Of course, we know that the proposed uh, uh, proposal is without any cost for the government, but that's not the case. No, it might be the case, but that is not really the actuality because they are going to manage and to operate the entire mega vaccine, uh, vaccination facility. So that has to have a control and should be under the operation and management of a governmental agency that is accountable to the uh, and subject to the uh, uh, audit of the uh, uh, auditing office of the government. So to my mind, why, why do we have to go to that facility? 
we have already facilities available. If out of pure beneficence, the proponent of the vaccination facility would like to really show his beneficence and generosity, there are other likely facilities or sites, particularly in this particular case that even the uh, people who are supposed to be vaccinated would be about 10,000 to 15,000 per day would not be having any uh, transportation access to the uh, facility. Now, may I propose, if we really want to donate and, and uh, give another alternative uh, facility, why not, for example, convert the Solaire ballroom and the uh, parking lots as an instant mega facility if, if you really want to show your beneficence and generosity. So uh, that would be my take. Uh, I think we have to hurdle a lot of legal issues that I had just mentioned, as well as the environmental law on measures that we have to hurdle in this particular context. That would be all, thank you. Thank you, Attorney Domingo. That was very insightful, actually. Thank you, sir. Um, maybe, maybe we could hear next from um, Dr. Padilla. Dr. Padilla, please. Hi. So, good evening. Is my video, my video and audio okay? Yes, sir. We're all good. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Franklin. So, um, my background is actually public health. So, um, uh, I teach uh, public health in UP Visayas. Uh, I'm, I'll just have a very short talk in terms of looking at the uh, technical requirements for a vaccination center. So I'm going to use as a reference the uh, DOH memo that specifies what is supposed to be a good vaccination center. Uh, this is also very timely because I was just vaccinated for the first dose, uh, AstraZeneca, today in Miagao, Iloilo, where UP Visayas is based. And I have a first-hand uh, experience in terms of looking at it as a doctor and at the same time as a client seeking to be uh, vaccinated. You know? uh, the, the duty for the vaccination center aside falls actually with the local government unit. In this case, if you are a municipality, the vaccination site uh, is really inside the rural health unit supervised by the municipal health officer. Uh, the DOH memo actually specifies, it's a department memo 2021-0116. And it specifies that an off-site uh, vaccination center should be linked with a licensed health facility. So uh, if Nine Filipino is going to construct that mega vaccination center, uh, I'm not, just not clear as to which medical facility will it be linked in case of emergencies. I'm not familiar of where the actual hospitals or tertiary hospitals are located near Nayong Filipino, uh, but that is the specification by the DOH. And uh, for local government units like municipalities or cities, the, the jurisdiction there falls upon the local chief executive. So there's a local uh, doctor uh, in charge, whether it is the city health officer or the municipal health officer that supervises all the vaccination that is being done in a particular site. Uh, so I would assume that for the mega vaccination center plan for nine Filipino, it's going to be under a national or regional vaccine operation center. Uh, I just don't know who will be the one in charge in terms of managing and trying to control the number of patients that are supposed to seek uh, uh, vaccination. The department memo of DOH also specifies that there should be minimum public health standards that should be observed. So uh, in terms of the physical layout of a vaccination center, uh, number one, there should be uh, open ventilation so that there is free circulation of air. Uh, there should be only one entrance and exit so that uh, there's one way flow of traffic. Uh, there should be a wash area in the entrance. And if it's going to be a mega center, 
uh, the wash area should be able to uh, 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 coordinate or should be able to cater to all the needs of the patients uh, that are going to undergo vaccination. And lastly, uh, the vaccination area should also have PWD ramps for senior citizens and for uh, persons with disabilities. So those are all specified. So my experience in Miagao Rural Health Center or Rural Health Unit is that, uh, of course, uh, there's a wash center. There's also a ramp as well. There's one entrance and exit to the vaccination center. Uh, but I think uh, the one minimum uh, standard that may be uh, that was a challenge for local government units is the physical distancing part because the lines were were the the, the clients that were seeking services were not really observing the minimum public health standards because of this very small area that is available in local government uh, units in their RHUs. Whereas if it's going to be a mega vaccination center, I think the physical distancing part requirement by the DOH should be easily met. Uh, aside from that, there's going to be different areas within a vaccination center. So there's going to be a waiting areas and there should be, uh, again, proper observation of the social distancing uh, rule. And there should be a supervisor of the whole area and a focal person per area that is specified. So for example, there should be somebody in charge in the waiting area, whether that is a nurse or uh, another healthcare, uh, health human resource, midwife, or maybe a barangay health worker. Now, we, as the, uh, my experience is that uh, the waiting area was too hot because they couldn't be accommodated inside the RHU. So there was just a tent outside the local health, uh, the uh, rural health unit. So, but in this case, if it's going to be a mega center, then this part, uh, this requirement of a very wide waiting area could easily be met. Uh, in the vaccination area wh where the patients go in after the waiting area, they have to have a registration area wherein a patients are screened and uh, give and uh, check if they sign the informed consent. After that, they go to the health education area wherein another health human resource will be able to explain what the vaccination is all about, what the side effects are, and what to watch out for immediately and two days or one week after the vaccination. Uh, there should also be a screening part wherein your uh, blood pressure, your heart rate, your oxygen saturation are taken in so that this will be all taken in account when, the, when you are jabbed with the vaccine. And finally, a vaccine area where uh, the nurse or the midwife will be able to uh, stick the needle and give you the, the box. After that, you are required to stay for 15 to 20 additional minutes after the initial injection or your first dose, whatever that is, first dose or second dose. Uh, so you have a post-vaccination area where, again, it is specified that there should be social distancing, there should be a toilet available, and uh, it should be linked uh, to an emergency uh, area of the rural health unit or the medical facility, just in case there are untoward incidents or untoward side effects related to the vaccine. And of course, lastly, uh, a vaccination center should also have adequate facilities for vaccine storage. And that becomes very important when we talk about uh, vaccines that require negative AT. So for example, Pfizer, would require a very uh, cold freezer, negative 80 degrees centigrade. For the others, like uh, Sinovac and AstraZeneca, they require only four degrees centigrade. So it's easier actually to deploy in uh, rural areas. Whereas the Pfizer vaccine would need a more urban, with the, which requires a very uh, cold freezer, may only be available in urban centers where uh, deep freezer, uh, negative 80 freezers are available. So in this case, if it's going to be nine Filipino, then the, 
the the vaccines that require cold storage, very cold storage, would be readily available. And lastly, a vaccination center, according also to the memo, should have a waste management uh, facility or waste management and disposal uh, area wherein all the needles and other medical waste should be properly uh, disposed of. So, uh, and uh, I, I think those are the main points of what constitutes a vaccination center that will be accredited by the Department of Health. Uh, my last uh, comment is, of course, uh, looking at the vaccination center holistically. And I agree with, uh, uh, with the former speaker, Attorney uh, Domingo, that the legal uh, point of view should also be explored and uh, looking at it with a whole of society approach, aside from the legal, the ecological, the public health and the medical point of view, uh, the decision whether to open it uh, should be balanced and should involve all the different sectors, uh, all the different um, stakeholders that have a say or that will be affected by the construction of such a mega vaccination site as proposed by uh, Nayong Filipino. So uh, that ends my talk. So I'll be happy to take your questions later. Uh, my, 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 my view is, uh, my talk is mainly centralized on the requirements of a vaccination center. Uh, whether that will be met or not uh, remains to be seen. Uh, we cannot say until the final plan is uh, available for uh, the, the scrutiny of the public. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Padilla, um, for that interesting points. Actually, you already mentioned several guidelines, so it would be you know, very helpful for those who are um, wondering what are the basic necessities for such a facility. Thank you, Dr. Um, next, we may we hear from the presentation of Dr. Cagayan, please. Please, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Franklin, for the uh, introduction. Uh, I'm following the talk of uh, Dr. Padilla, who is a public health expert. Um, I do have, I'm also a, a medical practitioner, but perhaps the perspective that I'm going to uh, bring about in this uh, multi-sectoral or multidisciplinary discussion on uh, Nayong Pilipinas, a mass vaccination site, would be probably give in a bird's eye view or from the community perspective, not just as a practitioner of medicine, but also as a member of the community, uh, of the community. So... I hope that's okay, Dr. Padilla. Are uh, you centered on um, the operational requirements for the creation of a mass vaccination? But uh, I would just like to put in a word or two, parang bird's eye view of why we need uh, vaccination in general. So when we talk of um, a health policy standpoint, we actually have two main strategies for mitigating the worst effects of the pandemic in our society. We have been uh, here in this pandemic for the past year, and we still see that uh, we might be here for the next two or three more years. So basically, what we would like when we think of uh, health policy strategies would be to minimize the number of deaths and slowing the rate of infections. And good news, we already have a vaccine that is approved. Not just one, but many along the pipeline. So um, when we talk of this, no, uh, looking at this, no, to fight the COVID-19, we want to achieve herd immunity. And vaccines have been developed at a super rapid, unprecedented speed. And as of March, or even as of now, we have at least 12 vaccines authorized for use uh, by at least one country, with 90 ca candidates more currently in clinical trials. We have heard the term herd immunity, or also known as population immunity. And this is the indirect protection from an infectious disease. And this happens okay, uh, when a population um, is immune either through a vaccination or immunity developed 
by having the disease. Basically, what you would like to have is the large number of people within a certain community or within the, the community to have uh, antibodies or to, to achieve immunity against the, the infectious uh, uh, disease. Okay. And what would be the possibilities for us when we talk of herd immunity? How could this play out in a year or two? For example, we all have our vaccinations, but we stop. No, we stop uh, doing the other basic, you no know, minimum health uh, health uh, precaution standards such as the mask wearing and removing limits on the crowded indoor gatherings. Definitely, despite uh, mass vaccination, we I think we still have we will still be uh, looking at additional waves or surging of surging infection. The virus will still be there, in fact, and kill many more people before the vaccination program reaches everyone. And that's really wouldn't be the only problem. Okay, so in the best case, though, no, um, uh, we vaccinate people as quickly as possible while maintaining distancing and other prevention measures to keep infections low. Okay, and to fight COVID, Okay. And looking here uh, at this slide, we uh, so we know that uh, we want to build a mega vaccination facility. Yes, we know the requirements needed uh, uh, to to say that uh, uh, this will be a good uh, a good way or a strategy of carrying out. Uh, the vaccination uh, plan for the country at a rapid speed. However, we know for a fact that successful national immunization programs will really depend much on up-to-date policies and effective strategies in order to achieve and sustain its goals. And it's not just about the vaccination facility. You can see here in this slide that a lot goes in, no? in terms of uh, the program, the immunization program rollout as a whole. Countries need to have a strong mechanism that enable informed decision-making about immunization priorities and the introduction of new program strategies, vaccines, and even technology. So here, you, know, you can have the included in the strategy should be the development and production of vaccines, how they will be allocated, how they will be deployed, and even the affordability of these vaccines. Thus, the Philippines have a national deployment and vaccination plan. Of course, it has. No? Uh, looking here, a large COVID-19 vaccination campaign is challenging for many developing countries in Asia and the Pacific. The COVID-19 vaccines are new, while some need to be kept in ultra-low temperature freezers for storage and distribution, as has already been mentioned by Dr. Padilla. And uh, we have to learn, as we still need to learn a lot about these vaccines. Now, many countries existing immunization, um, exist, existing immunization programs may not be ready for these new vaccines and regular uh, and may require new guidance including the adaptation of uh, current programs to allow large vaccination programs for adults and elderly people and this is where the uh, the nayong filipino nayong filipino vac uh, vaccination center comes in however a successful campaign will also require transport storage and logistics infrastructure, capacities in health facilities, sufficient medical personnel, safety monitoring, and a strong public awareness and advocacy campaign. So um, looking here at this slide, you can see that a lot of things should be happening and should be happening at the same time that this vac mega vaccine center uh, is being prepared. And I wonder if we will be able to carry this out as it is even in the in the local uh, government units, we can already see a lot of confusion happening. Um, I think, I, I don't know if you were able to look at uh, the news yesterday uh, when uh, one of the big malls was deluged by people clamoring to have the Pfizer vaccine, I think, because they didn't want the other vaccines, lahat sila. Even without the proper registration, a lot of people came in and wanted themselves to be vaccinated by, uh, with Pfizer vaccine. And that is really a logistics nightmare. What if a super spreader is there? No, So uh, it's all good. No? Having a mega vaccination center is actually uh, a good idea on paper if we're sure that we can, we can uh, comply with all the other components of uh, 
uh, a, a good immunization, national government or national immunization program. Does our government have one? Yes, you have. You can actually, if you're if you're interested in looking at the deployment, uh, uh, deployment uh, plan of the Philippines, it's the link is there uh, on my slide, and this is how it should be. Uh, uh, carried out no, from the operations uh, center chair up to the level of the implementing or uh, implementing or reporting unit. So a lot of things are happening uh, in the background. So as Dr. Padili has said, no, yung requirements will not just be the infrastructure. Marami pa yan, human resources, no, uh, even data how to monitor safety monitoring of these people should also be in place. And even if I am a member of the community, how will I be made, be made aware of this, uh, in for all of these informations and even the availability? So the Philippines has its own uh, strategy to make sure that we all achieve herd immunity. Um, basically, at least as early as uh, the last quarter of last year, you've already heard plans of acquiring at least 50 million vaccine shots by 2021. And in the news, uh, we hopefully we were thinking of having a herd immunity by the end of the year, but unfortunately, I think it has been uh, downgraded to just the NCR having at around 70% of its population uh, vaccinated by, at, by uh, November of this year. So you have seen how the vaccination plan is rolling out in the different parts of the Philippines. For most of us who are here in NCR, uh, just a few weeks up, starting this week. So we know uh, I, I, I am from PGH and we started the vaccination program March 1 or late uh, late February. So most of the most of the people who had Sinovac already finished with their full two doses, while those who had uh, AstraZeneca uh, are still waiting for their second dose or some have already received their second dose. But there are new players co coming in. No, uh, Pfizer has just come in and then a lot of people are already collaborating. And, but on my, uh, on my social media feed, I still see a lot of complaints in terms of the prioritization, the DOH priority lists are uh, not being followed. No, uh, so parang it's about people cutting the line to be first in uh, in getting vaccines. So will we ever get to herd immunity? Um, yes, hopefully sooner rather than later. As uh, we have seen a uh, vaccine distribution being rapidly uh, being rapidly scaled up. However, uh, issues would still be the slow distribution and av availability. If you want to look at our uh, the progress that we have as a country, you have the COVID-19 vaccine trackers. No? So this would be the total uh, vaccines, total doses that have arrived as of May 12. We have 7,779,050. Uh, however, uh, the doses are uh, distributed has uh, been a, a billion less, but uh, looking at the dose administered, which is the most important uh, thing here for us to be able to achieve this herd immunity, so-called herd immunity, is the vaccine that is that has been injected uh, within our body. So at the rate we are in, as of May 12, as of last week, only 2,623,093 Filipinos have been uh, given at least a dose of their uh, first vaccine. And again, as I said, I wanted to give you a bird's eye view. This is the vaccination timeline of our region. Uh, basically, what, how are our neighbors doing? How are they faring compared to us? So this is the prediction of when uh, the Philippines will be able to achieve its herd immunity. So antay lang tayo while the rest of the world, especially the first world countries are already opening their doors. Uh, uh, going out without masks, uh, starting to regain their old normalcy, so to speak. Uh, tayo siguro sa mga ano pa, mga late 2023-2024 ang tinitignan. Okay. Singapore, sabi, meron na. Kaya lang, as you have, uh, I think it's already in the news that they have another uh, surge. But their definition of surge is definitely different from our definition of surge. Siguro parehas tayo ng, hindi tayo parehas ng India. 
better ang situation natin than India but we don't want that. Pa pero ang ibang uh, first world countries when they say surge, magkaroon lang sila ng sampung bagong cases surge na yung sa kanila, nila lockdown na nila yung mga communities nila unlike in our countries. So what what is the difference of their uh, national strategies compared to ours? So for Indonesia, basically ganun din. Ang dami rin nilang kinuhang mga uh, vaccines from different uh, different suppliers no uh, and there there, there uh, uh, i think there are two main strategies you get vaccines from different suppliers but at the same time you also try to develop or at least produce your own vaccines or manufacture your own own vaccine so those are parang two pronged ways by by hoping uh, uh, by which we can actually ramp up or scale up uh, this herd immunity process Okay, same with Malaysia, but uh, uh, they're also, and looking at Malaysia's strategy, they have already, uh, they're, they're already doing their own uh, vaccine trials, but they're also developing their own uh, vaccines. Singapore is uh, way, way, way ahead of us uh, in terms of this herd immunity. Mas maliit din lang naman sila. Okay, and here. Uh, how where are we now as com uh, uh, comparing ourselves to our neighbors uh you can actually look at the our world in data uh in the internet and you can see how many how, where we are in terms of uh uh the share of uh the people being fully vaccinated against covid as compared to our neighbors and here in this slide uh as you can very well see the dark blue dark blue and the uh, relatively lighter blue would be the total number of vaccination doses administered per 100 people in the total population. So basically, you can see here that uh, first world countries have already received uh, multiple doses, different types of vaccines as compared to us. Okay, so now going back to the issue of that uh, na yung Pilipino, well, uh, my personal view on the matter is that, uh, well, hmm, it can have its benefits versus uh, benefits as well as um, uh, detriments, you know. Uh, uh, looking at it, logistics, support, and proper handling of vaccines are integral to successful immunization. The World Health Organization reports that more than 50% of vaccines are wasted globally every year due to temperature control, logistics, and shipment-related issues. Many developing countries in Asia and the Pacific are not ready for the enormous logistical challenges to distribute COVID-19 vaccines rapidly and safely under the stringent temperature requirements. So I think with having a mega vaccine uh, center, as what Dr. Padilla has already mentioned, uh, if they will be able to comply with all of these requirements, then probably that would be a good thing. However, uh, the success of a vaccination campaign will also depend on how it effectively reaches disadvantaged group of people who are poor, socially excluded, and or are residing in rural er areas which often face poor transport and energy, uh, and energy infra infrastructure. And as we all know, here in the Philippines, more than half of our population are still in the remote and rural er areas. So I don't know how we're all going to bring in uh, all the those Filipinos that have not yet been vaccinated and bring in them to that side, no? As it is, no? Uh, I think Las Piñas and uh, Paranaque is doing already good, a very good job of vaccinating its community members, okay, and the nearby area. So I don't know how we're going to bring in other people who are not vaccinated but are not living uh, near that site to have themselves vaccinated if they don't have their own uh, transportation uh, means, etc. So looking at a more macro and a holistic view, uh, we have five ways to make the vaccine rollout more equitable for everyone. First is we have to recognize the barriers to equitable quality healthcare. So it's not really not just a matter of the infrastructure. We have to acknowledge, respect, and address concerns. And I'm very happy to be part of this um, to, uh, of this discussion, uh, of this uh, multi-sectoral discussion, the Vox means uh, the voice. No, so uh, I'm just happy to be here and hearing the other perspectives of my co-speakers to empower choices with truth and transparency. And uh, this is just, and this is my 
own personal bias coming in, uh, I have yet to see a lot of transparency Transparency when it comes to uh, the, the way uh, a public health uh, process is uh, regarding management of COVID is uh, being rolled out. So another way to make sure that the vaccine rollout is uh, done more equitably is to engage trusted community leaders and enlist trusted messengers to create and deliver the message. So basically, we all need systems thinking in order to make sure that the ultimate goal of having a mega vaccination facility, which is to make sure that we reach herd immunity at the fastest time, would be carried out. Thank you. That's all for my, uh, for my uh, part. Thank you, Dr. Kagayan. Actually, I'm, I'm, I, I love the idea of you saying that we're going to have a herd immunity. It's a resounding yes. It's just, well, I guess, a matter of time. So, but I'm still, uh, I like that idea. All right. We, just a reminder to our viewers that we are streaming live um, via the Environmental Landscape Studio Laboratory YouTube page. And various Facebook pages. Again, just to re to um, share with you the UP College of Architecture um, official pala page, the UP Department of Philosophy, and the Philippine Bar Association Facebook pages. So, if you have any questions for our speakers, feel free to uh, put them there in the live chat um, through these streaming platforms. We shall open the floor to your questions in a very short while. Next, we shall proceed with the presentation of our fourth speaker, landscape architect, Alcazare. Sir, please. Good evening, uh, everyone, and uh, thank you, Frank, for the introduction. Let me share my screen. So thank you again for the, for, uh, to the organizers for uh, inviting me to this forum, and I've been uh, watching and listening very intently to the doc, the good doctors ahead of me. And of course, uh, the context of my talk is uh, slightly different and in, in, in it's the physical context in terms of uh, the design and the functioning of a park, as well as the reasons uh, for being of Nayong Pilipino. So now in Pilipino to a generation of uh, Filipinos going, growing up in the seventies was a key field trip and the park was uh, the Philippines in miniature and offered glimpses of the landscapes, architecture, food and festivals of the country. Next to the Rizal Park, it was the most popular green space in the metropolis until the late 1990s, when both facilities uh, started to deteriorate and lost patronage. The iconic park actually celebrated its golden anniversary last year, but unfortunately not in its original home inside, uh, beside the uh, uh, Manila International Airport or in the airport complex. Now the uh, foundation was set up in 72 um, by a, uh, a presidential decree and the purposes and objectives are generally uh, uh, in the areas of uh, development in terms of social sciences and humanities research. Um, but uh, number uh, letter uh, F is uh, of most interest to landscape architects and planners, which is to establish parks and recreation centers for the promotion of tourism in the country. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, foundation has overlaps with several other cultural institutions like the uh, CCP, the NCCA, the NHCP, and the National Museum. So it has always been uh, uh, a very, a very great sort of, uh, of institution, but it was set up and uh, st started in 72 and continues to this day. So the park uh, actually uh, at its height uh, was, was uh, uh, a tourism uh, destination for, for visitors uh, to Manila and to the country, as well as to uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, Filipino children, and it set the bar for such uh, uh, theme, cultural theme parks in Asia with even the Indonesians uh, following us uh, with their Taman Mini in Jakarta. But the park, uh, after a, a uh, uh, two decades of, uh, of its peak, uh, expanded to 45 hectares uh, and developed very nicely based on a uh, design by uh, IP Santos uh, for the landscape and the site design and the uh, architecture by the greats of Philippine uh, design 
like Lindy Loxin, Carlos Aguelias, Lorenzo del Castillo, Luisa Reneta, Gabriel Formoso, Angel Nakpil, and Mendoza brothers. The hotel was designed by uh, uh, Nakpil and Sons with the landscape architecture of the hotel by Dolly Perez. Unfortunately, because of lack of funding, uh, the park deteriorated and uh, the loss of popularity from the 19, 19th onwards, the advent of the big box uh, malls um, and the expansion of the city uh, led to its closure in 2002 because also mainly of the airport expansion at that, at which point there was a deal to exchange this uh, property with something in the, with a, another property in the reclamation area. And so a competition was uh, organized by the foundation, which was won uh, by uh, a young designer, Jason Buencelido, not a landscape architect, but he won the prize. And the implementation of that nine Filipino in the reclaimed area was given to Cesar Concho and Associates, again, not a landscape architect, but the uh, job was not completed and was uh, suspended in about 2003 because also of a change in administration and a change in the board uh, of the nine Filipino at the time. So this shows you uh, the pressure of the airport to recover the 45 hectares of very mature strands of trees and the loss of, uh, of a, uh, the, the, uh, the wetlands or the water body, which uh, served also as a natural uh, detention area for, for the whole uh, uh, Manila International Airport complex. This is a, one of the lowest levels. It is the lowest level in the whole complex. And the covering up of uh, such a natural system will lead to, uh, will lead to problems for, uh, later on. And uh, this is one of the things that uh, uh, was of concern of the board uh, when uh, this happened. So uh, the original site partly reopened in 2010. At that time, there was some thought of uh, fully reopening the park since its greenery and trees had matured and there was still, was and still need, was need to provide access to parks in this open space deficient capital of ours. Unfortunately, the uh, airport needed the land and Padgore needed the land and a deal was struck uh, with an exchange with the Philippine Reclamation Authority com completing the original intent of uh, the 2002. And that was for a 15 hectare property in uh, the uh, entertainment city. At which time, um, in by uh, 20, 2013, 20, uh, 2010, I'm sorry, there was a new administration under President Aquino, and I joined the board of the Nayong Filipino in uh, 20, late 2013 and stayed until 2016 at the transition to the Duterte administration. But just to show you the area of entertainment city, which is 660 hectares, so three times BGC and four times uh, Makati CBD, the Nayong Filipino uh, was not the original uh, uh, open space allotment, which was a 50 meter park easement along the edges of the reclaimed site. Uh, the, the new Nine Filipino was an afterthought. It's actually 15 hectares of which uh, uh, 5.4 uh, 5 hectares on the uh, right side eventually was leased out to uh, Mega World. And uh, this allowed the Nine Filipino uh, some money in its coffers, which was to fund the uh, transition or the transfer of the new nine Filipino, um, which is uh, the strategy that the board uh, for which I was a member uh, took in uh, 2015. So the proposed park and parkway system, uh, which I, I had also pushed, uh, which of course never saw fruition, uh, was uh, something that I felt uh, should and could still be done, which is to connect all of the edges uh, and connect the new Nayong Pilipino to Paranaque and Pasay by uh, pedestrian uh, bridges, as well as uh, parkways and esplanades that would ensure that everybody had uh, a very close access to uh, uh, open space and greenery. And this is the MOA and this is uh, the original intent. That's why you don't see uh, large buildings or permanent buildings in the 50 meter easement that's supposed to be a park. But of course the government, the PRA did not have money to develop it. And so it led to uh, uh, initiatives by SM like this to uh, 
quote unquote improve the area in exchange for allowing leasable uh, uh, establishments uh, like the FMB. So it's a compromise, but it's there. It's not ideal, but uh, it could have been uh, much better. Now this is the uh, this shows you the actual intent of all of the locators in Entertainment City, uh, which had eyed all of the area. Uh, for casino and related de development. This was a massive plan uh, paid for by Solaire that showed almost all of the area dedicated to casino and, uh, and entertainment uh, related uses with uh, some open space. But of course, uh, a park in this area serves only a very select clientele and uh, essentially just uh, the uh, people who go to the casinos and the hotels, not really a catchment of uh, the residential uh, uh, districts as uh, is the normal function of an open space. So this is the original intent. So it, it, uh, to, call a, uh, to call a spade a spade, uh, the, the, in, the agenda of all of the, the uh, locators and developers is really uh, more real estate and more developable real estate and open space is just a, an afterthought or if possible, uh, marginalized so it, it will be the minimum uh, expenditure for, uh, for the developers. Um, towards the end of my stay at the board, uh, we had looked at uh, a PPP uh, process to get uh, an investor to come in and develop the new Nine Filipino within a structure that uh, followed closely the original intent of, uh, of, a, uh, of a sampling of the rich uh, culture and diversity of uh, architecture and landscapes in the Philippines. This is in, uh, was prepared in uh, 2015 and 2016, just at the transition. Uh, and we had gotten to the point of uh, already getting the PPP, uh, the uh, office of the uh, PPP approving it uh, through NEDA, but we got hit by tran the transition into the third administration and the whole board was replaced by a board that actually abandoned all of this and replaced it with this. So the 9.5 hectares uh, was uh, within, uh, within a year and a half of the new board uh, at the start of the third administration that came in. Uh, they got into a deal with the Chinese uh, casino uh, operator, and this is the landings, the infamous landings uh, uh, scandal, which led to the uh, to the uh, firing of that entire board and replacing with the current board, uh, which was headed by uh, Attorney Kane. So just as uh, um, um, okay, that board actually uh, spent all the money that we had saved in the previous board on so many things other than the actual uh, requirements of uh, the foundation. But very quickly, uh, I personally do not see any uh, logic in, in developing the, uh, the 9.5 hectares of the new nine Filipino into a med me mega vaccination um, facility as uh, other, other sites like the uh, CCP has uh, immediately available about six hectares, which could be quickly turned into a megabox site, already paved and accessible via public transport uh, in easy distance from, from Taft, uh, uh, jeepneys and buses and the LRT. And there's a uh, public shuttle, as everybody knows, that goes to the CCP complex. And uh, it just does not make sense except until you uh, understand that the whole point of all of this power play, even in our old national uh, nine Filipino site, was the taking over of valuable real estate for eventual uh, commercial development and for profits to be made. So uh, let me just put everything in context. Uh, the context of, of the reclamation site is really a larger problem of uh, put the government pushing the agenda of reclamation without uh, heed to, uh, to concerns of the environment. And this is the largest context. We have to look at the nine Filipino and the entertainment site, uh, how we should look at them and how sh we should look at all of the decisions that we make in terms of the fiscal development of our uh, metropolis and the whole of the Philippines. So, um, 
uh, I was listening very intently on, on, on the news of uh, how and when we can reach herd, in, herd mentality to deal with this, with, this, uh, with this very dangerous virus that we have. But uh, after we do get herd in immunity, my final word is uh, and thought is that if we can address uh, the coronavirus and COVID-19 and uh, uh, finally uh, control it, I think we have to develop a virus to rid us of the, the, the more dangerous uh, virus of politics and uh, uh, profit of real estate developers. Thank you very much. Thank you, landscape architect Alcazarian, for that insightful um, take on these urban spaces. Um, so last but not the least for tonight, we have Dr. Espanola to um, share some of her uh, points uh, regarding this topic. All right, Dr. Espanola, are we all right? All right. All right. Uh, All right. Go ahead, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, uh, um, magandang gabi sa inyong lahat. Um, maraming salamat sa pag-imbita sa akin to attend this, uh, you know, discussion about this issue. Um, I really didn't have time to put together a lot of photos and slides, um, but I just would like to give some insight into how important Manila Bay is to migratory and resident birds, um, as well as its importance to the ecology of the area. So that area, Manila Bay, is very, uh, what, you, what you call this, um, it is, uh, well studied, no, for one. Uh, we have been doing surveys in that area for many years. So we have actually, uh, we have a database of all the birds that we have seen and uh, surveyed in that area, you know, for, for I think 20 to 30 years already. No, and we have identified um, quite a lot of internationally um, known and uh, uh, important uh, birds no, in terms of conservation. So one of them is this, this bird, no, the black-faced spoonbill. This one is endangered. And, and this bird uh, is also found in Taiwan and in other places because it is a migratory bird. As was uh, mentioned by Dr. Domingo, uh, the area is Manila Bay is important because it is a Ramsar site. No? So we are parties to that convention, uh, which uh, calls for the protection of migratory birds. So these are some of the birds that are found there. And, uh, you know, uh, protection of migratory birds. Uh, and not just the threatened ones, but these are threatened, no? So, kailangan uh, pangalagaan yung mga ibon doon, but especially these birds that are threatened, no? So, isa yan. Another um, threatened bird is the Far Eastern Curlew, no? Uh, ito naman, uh, endangered din siya. Ibig sabihin, uh, mataas yung level ng kanyang threat. No? So there are three uh, threat levels that are important for us to know. No? One is critically endangered. Second is endangered. And the third one is vulnerable. So this is the second category of the highest threats to a species. No? So endangered category. Ang IUCN yan, ang ibig sabihin yan, a international union for the conservation of nature. No? So, yan, yan yung pangalawa na endangered species na we found in that area, no? sa Manila Bay. The third one is the great knot. No? So, these three birds are the endangered species. The next one 
is the Chinese egret. No, this one is vulnerable. So it is also uh, under threat of going extinct. No, um, it seems that Manila Bay is one of its favorite places to go to during the migration season when it is winter up in the northern hemisphere. So this is a Chinese egret. And this one is our very own endemic Philippine duck, which breeds at La Papacheya, no? the Las Piñas Paranaque uh, uh, um, conservation area. No? So that area uh, has a breeding population of the Philippine duck. So, and, and finally, uh, we have these IUCN near threatened species. No? So, madami itong mga uh, species na ito that are not categorized as threatened currently, but the uh, trend in their population is decreasing. So, they are called near threatened. No? Why am I mentioning all these threatened species? The reason is because Manila Bay is a contiguous area. You cannot say that you can isolate just Bulacan or uh, dun lang sa tapat ng CCP or you cannot do that. No? That whole stretch of area, like in the, in the last slide of our previous speaker, you could see that whole stretch of Manila Bay is one contiguous area that is important to these birds. So my, my contention is um, if these birds that have uh, been seen along Manila Bay, um, but not uh, directly beside that area of uh, the Nayong Filipino, no, um, they can potentially occur there actually, no? So, ang ano dun, uh, that area, I'm not sure if um, what the status of nine Filipino now, but I was asked before to come up with ideas for creating that park, forest park in that area. So we were thinking of tree species to plant in that area that would mimic um, natural habitats of, of wildlife. And uh, I remember before that we were thinking that that area can be an extension of the wetlands of uh, Manila Bay because there is a naturally occurring uh, stream within the Nayong Filipino uh, site. No? So uh, in and of itself, Nayong Filipino is um, is a very uh, important site for wildlife. So my concern is if this uh, plan to build this mega vaccination area there um, is only temporary, medyo I'm amenable to it, but if like what the previous speaker has said, that it is really a ploy to create something else in that area that is more permanent than that, then, you know, we will be losing all these species. No? Although I cannot say that um, keeping that area intact um, can really save the species, but it will go a long way in saving them. No? It will expand uh, significantly the area with which these species can actually uh, thrive at no? and, uh, and breed. Uh, well, especially for the Philippine duck, which is endemic to us. All the rest of the species that I mentioned are migratory. No? Um, so yun yung, uh, yung contention ko. So um, le just let me mention um, some numbers. No? 
there are around 171,500 to around 208,500 water birds that visit Manila Bay during the breeding season. That's quite a lot of birds, no? So given all the development that's going on around Manila Bay, are we willing to lose more space for the birds? No. Uh, because this area is part of the East Asian Australasian Flyway. That's the reason why we get all these birds. No. So, Yun, uh, it, it may be small, no, 9.5 hectares. It may seem small for the birds, no. But it's important that we provide them with all the remaining habitat in Manila Bay no, that we can find uh, instead of reducing it. No? Um, it's just something that we owe them no? uh, because these, these birds, as you can imagine, uh, they have no say in all these politics. No? Um, it is up to us to provide them with a secure home with a secure place for them to, um, to feed and to roost no? on their uh, migration journey. So um, I think uh, I've taken enough time already to talk about this. Um, I wasn't able to dig up uh, more figures uh, from my papers, but uh, you can just ask me questions. You, you can send your questions to me later on if you have any. Thank you so much. All right. Um, thank you, Dr. Española, for that um, interesting take. Um, actually, um, it's good to hear that, you know, um, the birds don't have a say. Yeah, so that, that's also a good perspective. So, I mean, in any development, actually, at that point. So, um, thank you to our five presenters for the night. Um, after hearing their presentations, we are now open to um, address some of the questions that have uh, been gathered from our streaming platforms. All right. So, all right. So maybe we could um, invite um, all our speakers to um, kindly turn on their um, cameras so that um, we could um, share them on uh, all right, on our platform, YouTube platform. All right, thank you. All right, so um, actually an interesting um, mix uh, of um, comments. Um, I think that's normal for, especially for this kind of um, topic. Um, so um, maybe we'll just start with the first question. This is from, the, um, from our YouTube um, live chat. Um, Someone is asking, why another infrastructure? Um, why not utilize other, arena, other areas like or an, an arena or malls or uh, um, other spaces? Um, Sir Paolo, what do you think? Yes, that's the <laughs> obvious question. And everybody knows the answer to that. So somebody is after some, something else and the agenda is not uh, what it, it, it seems. So, you know, uh, there are only two types of people in the world, right? <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, how about um, the other um, speakers? Maybe we could hear from um, Dr. Padilla. What do you think? Um, why is there a need to build such facility? Is there a need to build such facility? Uh, if you ask me that specific question, I think there's a need to put up a vaccination area. Whether there is, uh, whether it is the right site to put up the vaccination area, I cannot answer that. But I would echo the point of uh, Dr. Fay, Dr. Fay, that uh, we need to really uh, upscale our vaccination efforts so that we. The earlier that we, we achieve herd immunity, the better for the Philippines. So the debate as to where that facility is, uh, I cannot answer. Uh, where should it be placed? Is it na yung Filipino? Is it the correct place to put it? Uh, are there better places, for example, where it can be established? 
uh, as mentioned already by the former speakers, that might be more accessible and uh, would not be a threat to, as Lala also mentioned, would not be a threat to the wildlife population. Right. If, if I may, uh, Frank, I just Peter, want to, ahead, uh, I have a, uh, 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 the, the lesson, the lesson uh, to be learned in uh, moving forward for how we, uh, how we build our cities or how we retrofit our cities uh, for, the, for the new normal is to understand that basic services that government is responsible to give to all of us citizens must be located within easy access of everyone. The problem with uh, how our towns and cities are currently, currently built is that a lot of uh, uh, the primary uh, service centers like hospitals are not located where they're supposed to, to be or in, with, with uh, equal access for everyone. They are uh, often low hanging fruit or oh, let's put the hospital there because somebody donated the land. It should be when you do your land use planning, you have to locate all of the primary, secondary, and tertiary health institutions within access of the people they're supposed to serve. Until now, people are still having to commute three hours to PGH. There are a few other government hospitals, and they're also concentrated in Quezon City. If you look at the metropolis, the first thing you have to put in is health infrastructure, aside from, and, and uh, not necessarily just first car infrastructure. It must be infrastructure for basic services. And that's the lesson we have to learn. If we do not learn this lesson, we will not be prepared for any future pandemics. And we will not be prepared for when all of our uh, country becomes uh, totally urban or at least uh, 70 or 80% urban. We have to think about it now, make the policies and uh, go and do the action to, to locate uh, our hospitals and we need to build more of them. That's the other thing. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sir Paolo. Um, Dr. Cagayan, would you like to add? Do you have anything else to add? I, I was just going to say that uh, I'm looking at this facility. If it's really going to be built, it will be a big white elephant once again. A lot of the money that the government has put in, in terms of health services are brought into infrastructure. And we know for a fact, no, it's nearing election time once again. Uh, aside from the fact, uh, aside from the natural reserve, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, this edifice actually you can put your name there, and your name will be immortalized forever. But it, when when we're talking about health service delivery, no, uh, and this just and this just just not involve the immunization program. No, not just the COVID, but the, 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 all the health services required from our uh, government. Um, wala eh, kulang sa systems thinking. Uh, even now, as uh, the vaccination program is being rolled out in the LGU, who is monitoring the different problems uh, that each of the local government units are, uh, are encountering? Uh, how is, are we agile in terms of answering the different problems? Is the answer a mega facility at this point in time? We're not even sure about our data. How many of our, how many of our uh, people are being given the vaccination? Sabi ko nga eh, sa feed ko na lang, most of my friends are already volunteering. I have volunteered to be a jobber, to be a vaccinator. Ilang kaya, ilang kayang tao ang kailangan? Uh, nagbagtusok at magvaccinate dyan sa mega center na yan. Saan nila kukunin yung mga tao na, magpapava- na magvavaccinate? Paano nila papupuntahin dyan yung mga taong kailangang i-vaccinate? Sino-sino ang mag utilize niya ang infrastructure na yan? Those are simple questions from a health perspective side. But again, we go back to the first question of our uh, audience a while ago. Napakarami ng available na na locations, na facilities, andyan na. In fact, bakit hindi na yung utilize? Bakit kulang na kulang pa rin? Kasi hindi naman talaga infrastructure ang problema natin. Our problem right now is the availability of the vaccines and how these uh, vaccines will be rolled out to the public. That's just how it is. Are we answering the right question with that facility? All right. Thank you, Dr. Cagayan. Um, Do- Attorney Domingo, would you like to, do you have anything else to add to the 
to the discussion for this point? Well, it's just very nostalgic for me, having been a product of the uh, Diliman commune. And, and I can hear my, my fellow guests saying something very, very intensely and very passionately about having to correct uh, certain wrongs that we see in our government. No? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's not a matter of conflicting opinions or options. No? It's a matter of following what ought to be done, both from the legal and environmental standpoints. Kung hindi natin maano yun, masusunod natin yun, I don't think there's any reason for us to proceed with the planned uh, vaccination or mega vaccination facility. Ang, ang hirap sa atin, eh, with all due respect, uh, medyo nag, uh, legal shortcuts tayo eh. Kaya ang mga tao nako-confuse, ano bang dapat gawin natin? And more importantly, if there is really an expression of beneficence or generosity on the part of the proponent of the vaccination uh, facility, eh marami namang alternative uh, situs, no? Meron namang uh, alternative venue na, na pwedeng piliin. At magaganda pa yun. At almost instantaneously, you have the facility there. It's a matter of just adjusting the, uh, the peripherals and others. I don't want to impute any malice or bad faith on the proponent. I want to be very clear on that. If we can hurdle the legal, uh, legal uh, issues as well as the environmental issues, I'll be with him. But I'm not very confident that we can do that at, at this point, you know, given that it seems that there are other legal factors that are not being addressed by the proponent and the government officials concerned. All right. Um, thank you, Attorney Domingo. Um, all right. Maybe we could move on to the next question. Um, well, again, um, perhaps another question would be, um, what is the impact of this megavax facility development on ecosystem services that humans benefit from? Um, Maybe um doctor yeah go ahead doctor Padilla please no I, I was just going to say I think it's right. uh, Lala it's Lala yeah Lala ah, right. <laughs> yeah. All right. doctor La doctor Espanola please can uh -huh. we hear your point yeah oh oh so ano yung impact niya um uh, well for one we will be losing a piece of that habitat that is actually supposedly for birds um is science uh Nalungkot ako nga about the, uh, I know it's another issue, issue altogether. I know it is uh, totally different though. But the Bulacan Airport is a similar sort of development to this. No? Where they, they were just looking at profits. They were not looking at the impacts to people's livelihoods and, and, and all the, the things that go with it. No? So ito, it's supposedly a park. So kapag mawala yung opportunity to build a park there for wildlife and for people to enjoy, so that is one thing that we will lose. No? So when you say kasi ecosystem services, um, madami yan eh. Uh, meron siyang uh, provisioning services, meron ding mga services that has to do with uh, the spiritual side of... of uh, of things, no? So, um, people's appreciation of beauty and uh, appreciation of, of nature, no, in general. So, kasi, well, sa totoo lang, nauugat yung ating uh, most of our livelihood ay nakaugat dyan sa, sa nature, no? So, uh, may deep uh, connection tayo to nature that we're, we're not sometimes aware of. So if you deprive people of access to nature, you are depriving them of something that will affect their spirits. No? Uh, something that will um, 
we are all poorer because of of this deprivation no so uh, isa lang yan isa lang yan sa mga bagay na nakikita ko na we will potentially lose no uh, kung mawala yan um pero i'm sure na kasi landscape architects can you, you you totally understand that to um siguro yun lang muna ang masasabi ko but Uh, uh, there could be more. Um, I'll think about it later and add. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dr. Carmela. Um, Sir Paolo, would you like to add something? Oh, Ayon. well. Uh, go ahead, sir. Uh, the whole reclamation strategy of, of government is a default uh, that leads to, to us paying the consequences generations from now, and we have to stop it as a, as a matter of policy. But it's now embedded in national development policy that reclamation is the way to go because of uh, it eases uh, the the process of developers uh, consolidating enough land uh, which is owned by a single entity the pra compared to having to deal with 1000 landowners within uh, towns and cities and so even though uh, even though it's expensive th- these developers will pay for it uh, versus having to deal with uh, with uh, property rights so as a policy i think I, i think we have to look at this as a national policy decision a shift in national policy that affects us uh, uh, and affects our environment and ultimately uh, our our capacity to adapt to ch- climate change and to mitigate disaster in our country right um thank you um sir paolo um Does anyone else want to add? All right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, next, um, we can move on to the next question. Um, what will? What do you think uh, will be the future purpose of this mega vaccine vaccination facility when it's no longer needed? Um, will it? Will its use? Will do you think? Will its use be uh, sustainable? Or won't this be just again another white elephant after a year or two? The, the site is obviously the target for acquisition by the locators around it. All of them want it because it's just too prime, it's just too large. Uh, uh, one third of it has already gone. It used to be 15 hectares, now it's only 9.6. Uh, and and uh, as I've shown in, in my, sli- my slide, uh, they've already made plans. And they, all of the developers are currently making plans for when uh, the, the, uh, the vaccine dies away or uh, is diminished. And uh, a lot of uh, developers are planning their, their projects already now in anticipation of that. And uh, the first thing that they're planning is uh, adding to land, bank- land banking uh, opportunities. And this is uh, one such opportunity. Um, and uh, that's what we have to uh, guard against, but I, I doubt if we, we can, because uh, private corporations are in cahoots with our government for uh, both their agendas. That's all I, I can say. Thank you. Um, let's just Catherine... vote, if I may, let's just vote wisely <laughs> next year. <laughs> All right, sir. That's uh, noted, sir. All right. I think uh, I would also encourage more voters, you know, to register this time. All right. For for everyone's, uh, you know, future, uh, you know, future. All right. Um, Attorney Domingo, would you like to add sir, um, something, if, if you may? I can't really add more with what uh, the landscaper uh, expert uh, just mentioned. But what I'd like to stress is that is it really a conflict of options? I think we have to address ourselves there. No? Let's focus on that. Hindi naman dapat magkatunggaling dalawang options. Kung talaga lang nating tutukuyin kung anong tama. Unfortunately, the media had been obfuscating the issues. No? Many of our media practitioners are obfuscating for good reasons. You know exactly what's happening. No? So ang dapat nito, taasan ng kaalaman ng mga tao 
Kasi nag-uusap tayo dito, Tagalog. Dapat Tagalog tayo ngayon eh. Kagaya ng gagawa natin noon, nilalabanan natin yung diktadura, no? So dapat uh, papalalalin natin ang 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 pambansang kausapan para malaman nila kung ano mga issues dito. Kasi ang nangyayari ngayon, natatalo tayo. Against ba kayo sa COVID-19? Parang they are trying to simplify and make it simplistic na iyon ay uh, pabor ka ba sa facility ng pang-COVID o hindi? Parang ginagawa niyang ganun eh. Hindi ganun naman talaga ang issue eh. Ang issue is tama bang gagawin natin? Sabi nga ng iba nating guests, uh, speakers, wala lahat ng plano eh. Everything's a knee-jerk planning eh. Walang sistema. Wala tayong blueprint. No? And, and this will be a very, very sorry state for the Filipino people as well as the generations to come. Tanong mo sa akin, anong gagawin po doon pag natapos na yung ating pandemic? Magiging elephant ba yan? White elephant? Very obvious. Sabi nga nung landscaper, si, uh, I forgot his name kasi senior citizen na ako, sabi niya, eh ano eh, alam naman natin kung sino ang naglaland banking dyan eh. Alam naman natin yun. Know, they're actually paving the way for them to acquire and eventually take over the, the park uh, facilities, the parking areas. Very obvious naman yan. Kailangan natin pag-isipan pa yan. But sabi niyo nga, kailangan malaman ng mga tao ang nangyayari. And I think I welcome this kind of discussion, uh, Frank. No? I think you should do this oftener and get the people who are concerned and tell the people exactly what's happening. In the same manner that my Philippine Bar Association that I am a part of has been in the rule of law advocacy. Pinapakita rin namin sa mga tao kung ano nangyayari sa West uh, Philippine Sea alam namin na pinapakita na namin sa mga tao kung anong nangyayari sa Anti-Terrorism Act. Ngayon, kaya kami sumasama dito sa inyong diskusyon because gusto namin pataasin ang antas ng kaalaman ng mga tao dito sa mga nangyayaring issues na ito. Thank you, Attorney Domingo. All right. So, I think there are a lot of uh, viewers who are actually, you know, um, listening to to your points and you know um we're actually moved uh you know to somehow this con this opening up this venue to talk about issues like this you know um especially from different uh, perspectives you know all of you have given um quite some um something to think about especially for tonight all right so um actually there are certain questions that are still coming in but I don't think we have enough time for that for tonight. So um, we wish we could entertain more. Um, but since we are pressed for time, the questions that have been forwarded through the streaming platforms will be forwarded to our panel experts uh, for uh, future um, uh, answers, Siguro. All right. So to give a synthesis of tonight's presentations and exchange of discussion or exchange of ideas and discussion, we invited two distinguished reactors. Our first reactor is currently an assistant professor of philosophy at UP Diliman. He has extensive experience in teaching several ethics and philosophy courses at UP Manila and UP Los Baños before teaching in the Diliman campus. He earned his PhD in philosophy from the University of Bergen in Norway, currently working on several initiatives related to context sensitivity in ethics and logical reasoning. We have with us Dr. Lumberto G. Mendoza. Followed by our next reactor, whose national and international experiences include landscape architecture, environmental planning and management, project formulation and resource mobilization, and urban and rural development planning, among others. He conducts research, prepares proposals for bilateral and multilateral funders, and participates in evaluating foreign-assisted initiatives, having work experiences in countries like Vietnam, the US, the UK, and the Philippines. He teaches landscape architecture and environmental planning and management to our students in UP Diliman. We are thankful to have with us landscape architect Honorio T. Palarca. First, let's hear from Dr. Mendoza. Dr. Mendoza, the floor is yours.
Sir, you're in on mute. Sorry. Go ahead, sir. You're on mute, sir. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Frank. Uh, I just want to take you take you from the message of Attorney Domingo that perhaps we should speak in Tagalog because what we now have is also a battle of language and we need to uh, uh, address the general uh, general public. So I have, yun, nag, naghanda po ako ng, isa po ako sa nag, nag, nag-formulate ng question. Tapos nanggagaling po yung aking reaction or commentary. Da, dalawa po, uh, sa filosofiya, so meron po kami mga fallacies. Uh, i-introduce ko po dito yung false dilemma or false dichotomy. So usually po kaming mga philosopher, uh, wala po kami masyado sa facts, yun po yung limit namin. Uh, and it's it has been a blessing that I have been involved in STS. That's why uh, yun, yung, yung mga mode of reasoning na susundan po ngayon ng FRAX. Pero uh, uh, sa, salamat po sa inyong cue at sa inyong pagbabahagi. Uh, sa palagay ko po, kahit naghanda po ako ng PowerPoint na ito, hindi po nito mabibigyan ng hustisya. Hustisya yung... Uh, I, I will try po na, na kasi po napaka haka inspire ang inyong mga pagbabahagi. So tama po kayo Attorney Domingo. Uh, uh, gusto ko po sanang i-phrase yung summary ng ating uh, uh, pag-uusap tungkol sa tunggalian between on the one hand po ay pagpapahalaga sa kalikasan uh, at sa, sa isang banda ay uh, pag-response sa ating health emergency. So sa, sa logic po, meron, pasensya na po medyo technical. Uh, nire-represent po namin siya, meron kang dal- isang option, halimbawa, nature preservation, tapos B, uh, health emergency. Tapos, kapag ka po dilemma, hindi pwedeng uh, nature preservation and health emergency, emergency at the same time. Uh, nakakatuwa po na very honest at <laughs> saka direct ang mga speakers natin. No? Uh, let's call a spade a spade. <laughs> Perhaps uh, perhaps the dilemma is a false one no uh, kasi uh, yung third option si marami namang areas na available pero siguro siguro po let us let me just entertain the this the idea of what counts as a false dichotomy and how it works kasi po ang nangyayari nagkakaroon ng false di, uh, false dilemma para siyang nagkakaroon ng misrepresentation ng argument so yung kinuha ko po to sa internet internet so either you allow prayer in schools or you're an atheist. So halimbawa, sa UP po, uh, we don't allow prayer to respect all different religions. So not necessarily, or including the different religious beliefs, which includes the atheist. Uh, pero it doesn't mean that uh, we disrespect faith. <laughs> On the contrary, it's about respect. So yung context po ng ating uh, discussion, this time, it's about responding to a health emergency through the building of a mega vaccine facility. And on the other hand, uh, sabi nga ni Dr. Uh, Doc Lala, uh, baka connected yung, uh, na, na yung Filipino site uh, sa, sa pinamumugara ng mga migratory birds na endangered na po. No? So uh, naalala ko po, binanggit ni uh, uh, na chairman Enrique Rezon sabi niya there is no nature there it's just a lahib pero the migra- migratory birds also live in in the lahib no it's part of nature baka meron mga misconception that it need to be addressed in that sense so ang ang the, the way false dilemma works po is merong psychological ano parang attack on the other person who who disagrees kasi halimbawa if you don't agree with the mega mega vaccination site parang kinakalaban mo na rin yung uh, move para para improve yung rate ng inoculation inoculation hindi ka na rin tumutulong sa public health emergency hindi naman po ganoon no kaya napakaganda po ng mga suggestion halimbawa uh, yung sa si Paolo Alcazarin about the CCP uh, area or yun nga si Attorney Domingo sabi niya why not just use the solar no uh, so din po kasi yung C option C na binabanggit dito na pwedeng uh, we respond to nature preservation and the health emergency uh, so yun po siguro yung yun napaliwanag ko na po siya uh, yun nga, meron pa, dun po, ang ginawa ko rin po dito, sinundang ko yung mga debates sa interview ni na Atty. Isberto 
Attorney Kay at saka ni uh, Chairman Razon. Tapos may mga comment, bakit hindi gamitin yung William Moore Air Base? Kasi baka doon magagalit yung mga general. <laughs> Tapos bakit hindi gamitin yung mga unused classrooms dahil online learning naman tayo ngayon. Tapos maraming basketball courts na na available na yun. Well, na, kahanga-hanga po ngayon ang ginagawa ng landscape uh, uh, architecture, College of Architecture. Kasi mukhang alumalabas po, uh, you are dealing with the politics of space. <laughs> What would be a logical way of, of, of planning spaces so that we could really serve the people, no? at least in the construction of uh, health facilities or... So yun, yun nga po. Uh, second, are there, other, are there no other options on how, how we can be assured that the construction will have the least damage to the biodiversity that is now found there. Siguro this would respond to the comment by, from, the, from our health, uh, health practitioners. Uh, uh, talagang uh, uh, pangmatagalan ba yan? Uh, pwede, ma-assure ba natin na pang, pang sandali lang? Uh, kaya lang ang lumalabas eh ploy nga po eh uh, baka may pa, parang baka maging gawin nilang president na because they were able to circumvent certain legal uh, grounds or prohibitions then it can be another ano basis for their ploy no ang suggestion ko nga sana nung una kung talagang kailangan kailangan nating mag-build ng vaccine facility doon uh, perhaps it can be constructed in a way that causes least damage to the environment Pero pasensya na po, minsan po kasi yung mga architect at mga na-hire na uh, for, for, for the construction, eh minsan uh, they're also at the back of the investors. No? So, pero, pero yung third question po siguro is a more philosophical one. Yung conflicting options po ba, is it something that is found as, it, as in our, in, is it something that is found as in given this, in the situation? Or is it created by virtue of how we perceive the situation? No? Mukhang ang lumalabas po eh, yung perception natin dito manipulated eh, uh, by the media. Eh. Uh, so yun, uh, and, and it's really nice po that we are having these kinds of conversation. Yun nga po, siguro uh, isa pong may co-contribute pa ng iba pa kasi yung issue ng truth eh, sa issue ng concepts no so what counts as nature if you build it on a, on a vacant area does it does it uh, also damage nature uh, yes <laughs> may biodiversity pa rin doon through the talahib tapos uh, ito po yung lumalabas yung ating po mga public health practitioners no talagang uh, si Dr. Kagayan at Dr. Padilla so uh, siguro ang basic ang pagkaalala ko sa sabi ni Dr. Padilla uh, will the mega vaccine facility uh, parang count as a legit, legitimate uh, vaccine facility so meron bang mga waste contamination area tapos how does it connect with the other uh, health facilities is it properly planned no tapos si Dr. Fake kagaya naman uh, ito na sa slide how does it fit into the our national vaccination plan kasi uh, kinakailangan ba natin medyo i-decentralize yan? Tapos sinasabi, sinasabi po kasi na sa CNN debate, accessible siya. Eh. Pero accessible to who? Is it only to those who have cars? Sabi nga ni uh, architect Alcazarin. Eh. Baka why not just use CCP? No? Uh, mas accessible siya. So who are we again catering for those who, who are more affordable, in the for, who, are, who are relatively well off in the first place, but not to the poor? So yun, yun po yung mga questions. Uh, personally po, uh, yun, kasama ko po dito si Ma'am Lala. Uh, it's nice to see you here po. Uh, I'm actually concerned po about uh, how Metro Manila needs more parks and green spaces, breathable spaces. Kung meron na pong parang, uh, fi, uh, yung, yung fear ko po, pasensya na nagpasok ako ng sarili kong opinion. Uh, how it baka po nga mag-intrude siya dun sa need pa natin for those kind of spaces. Sabi nga nung ni, uh, ni, Doc, ni uh, architect Alcazarin, yun nga eh, let, let's, let's, the only thing it, that, that would make it logical if, it's, if it were a ploy for real, real estate uh, profit. So talagang nakatakot po yun, no? Uh, so, uh, yung... Gusto ko po sana ng paraan ng pag-conclude or 
perhaps pag pag pagbato ng idea kasi po ang panahon po ngayon ay collaborating with each other helping each other pero uh, iniisip ko how how can we be yun be uh, uh, sabi, sabi kasi ni Attorney Domingo if you really want to be generous why why not uh, just donate uh, donate solar no uh, I, I, honestly I don't know how to answer that pero siguro uh, uh, perhaps we can still convince them uh, through these kinds of uh, discussion and also talk to the people tapos gusto ko po sanang i-comment lang yung sinabi ni uh, Doc, uh, uh, our Vice President Cynthia Bautista kasi parang related din po siya dun sa visual image dito ng box no kasi yan may conflicting options uh, option between the vaccine facility and the green spaces pero ang lumalabas po kasi dito yung decision natin would come from us from the crowd no uh, and that decision might, might uh, should be a wise one, wise one if and only if we have this kind of discussion and if we somehow win in the battle of language. So yun lang po yung aking reaction. Salamat po. Thank you, um, Dr. Mendoza, for that um, synthesis. May we hear from our very own um, landscape architect, Palarca, sir? Sir Nari. Yes, sir. Okay. Go ahead, please. Maraming salamat, uh, Frank, at uh, sa mga magigiting na nagsipagsalita at sa inyong pagbabahagi ng inyong mga kaalaman. No? Uh, Unang-una, gusto ko sanang sabihin na isa akong environmental planner, isa rin akong landscape architect, at uh, sa ngayon ay di ko mapigil na sabihin na isa rin akong real estate broker. No? So medyo nako-contextualize ko yung yung dilema no nung gusto nating iparating sa kanila. Gusto ko sana magpakita ng a few uh, slides no. Uh, pwede ba ako mag-share ng screen? Yes sir, go ahead. Okay, uh Oh, ano ba yun? Wait. Ah. Meron akong hinandang uh, screen dito. Pero i-skip ko na lang yung mga iba. No? Okay. Uh. Gusto, ito yung uh, binigay sa akin. No? Nag-request ako ng land use map ng area. Ito yung binigay sa akin. At um, dito makikita natin na yung entertainment uh, city properties itong red. No? Ito yung property na pinag-uusapan natin. Tapos nakikita nyo na sa paligid niya itong dark brown mixed use residential and commercial. Ito high-end residential. No? Tapos ito yung mga other. Tapos ang banda rito sa baba yung uh, protected area. Protect, protected wetland. No? Ngayon, ang pinag-uusapan natin ito, nasa gitna siya ng massive development na nangyayari sa paligid nito. No? So, anong kwan? Anong pwede mangyari pag uh, you are hemmed in? No? All, all uh, interest na nakatutok sa'yo, ikaw lang ang bakante. No? Kung titingnan natin ngayon, ano-ano yung mga nasa paligid niya? Resorts World, pa entertainment city Manila Bay homes so lahat built up area na yan may merong a few areas na bakante pa rin pero lumang Google uh, Earth picture na to eh so probably iba occupied na rin no? so if you kung 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 pagtutuan na natin ng pansin itong lugar na to na bakante eh lahat ng interesadong investors eh talagang kukunin niyan ang unang-una Katulad ng sinabi ni Paolo, napakataas na ng halaga niya. No? Imagine mo, reclaimed area yan. In a very nice place. No? Tapos eh, napaliligiran ng 
ng investors na handang mag-invest pa. So, nakatuon ngayon ng pansin nila na makakuha yan, makakontrol yan. Yung sinasabi ni Dr. Domingo, eh, ni Attorney Domingo, na kay, papayagan ba yung private uh, entity to manage and control this area? And yung sinasabi ni Paolo na this is just a real estate uh, land banking type of an endeavor, eh, kitang-kita naman. It's very obvious. So. Ngayon, nagkataon na, na somewhere... Ayan. It's only 3.1 kilometers no, from uh, the Las Piñas uh, critical habitat. Napaka-igsi niyan para sa, sa migratory birds or sa birds. No? And pagka sinabi nilang oh, matatreten yung glide path ng aeroplano, I, think, I don't think so. No? Kasi wala siya dun sa glide path nito. Ito yung airport, ito yung runway. Tsaka yun. So hindi... Uh, All things are saying na pwedeng maging alternative na site ito for the migratory birds. Unang-una, hindi lang natin, kahit na hindi na natin banggitin yung migratory birds. No? Sabihin na lang natin, yung katulad ng sinabi ni uh, yung uh, uh, wait, uh, <laughs> ni Dr. Espanyola na Napakalakas ng affinity natin sa nature. No, napakalakas nung nung uh, kailangan nating yun nga, yung experience natin natin, natin ngayon, uh, nakatago tayo sa mga bahay natin pero once in a while sinusubukan nating lumabas, no? Sinusubukan natin kasi gusto nating to go back to greenery, to go back to to fresh air, no? Yan yung nakikita natin dito na na Paano natin maititreat ito na isang property na kailangan protektahan, kailangan ma-enjoy, it's an open space na available, it's a breathing space, it's a break in the urban jungle na available saan. Tapos eh, ma-occupy lang. No? Lahat ng mga argumento natin against the development of this one as uh, presented by everybody, no? although sinasabi si Attorney Domingo, came up with the legal and ecological issues no si uh, Dr. Padilla uh, yung requirements ng kwan na pwedeng uh, it's it's uh, infrastructure requirement no? na pwedeng i-provide no si si Dr. Cagayan eh, kinompare tayo sa how we we fare with other countries no and uh, ano yung prognosis na gaano kailan natin makukuha ang herd immunity which is very very gloomy pa uh, until this no and then si Paolo uh, binigyan tayo ng glimpse ng hidden agenda ng mga developers no? nandito and uh, ito yung nakikita ko rin when I was working with uh, real estate noon no? na nakikita ko yung land banking is is a good thing kung walang other issues na ano, kunwari private investors will do land banking okay like again the oro did land banking dumating yung yung bagyo they were able to come up with uh, uh, emergency shelters no yung iligan did not do land banking so nakanganga sila rin walang so land banking is good pero dito land banking with a hidden agenda eh mukhang mahirap gawin no ang maganda nga nung kwan eh, yung speakers natin ngayon eh parang dream team. <laughs> Now we were able to really discuss openly and uh, clearly ano-ano yung yung mga yung mga ano no all the the uh, interest groups that are working on this no. And ano yung mga interest groups that are trying to sort of fight all this no ganun yung nakikita ko rito na ano man ang tapos ang nakakalungkot nito no nung nung uh, naghanap ako nung mababasa ko rito yung uh, yung design na ginawa rito ang pinakita na idle land daw yan walang uh, which was 
old, no old pictures. Tapos eh nung nagresearch pa ako further eh ano na pala siya no? Yung may growth na doon sa area. So tama yung sinabi nung ni attorney, no? Look for other areas. Sinabi rin ni Paolo, look for other areas. No, kasi why focus on this? Kung ang reason mo lang eh mag maggawa ng temporary vaccination facility. Eh, ang dami namang area na immediately you can convert into a vaccination facility. But if you are going to disregard no, the yung, yung locational characteristics niya, yung ecological services that it can provide, I think uh, kawawa naman ng Pilipinas. <laughs> kawawa naman if uh, ang ating leadership eh, will go towards the creation of that uh, soon to be white elephant in the area. Ang pinaka masaklap na indicators dito, kunwari after all uh, yung yung dust has settled. No? E pagka nagpasok na sila ng pile driver yan sa lugar, tapos na yung... Uh, kasi ibig sabihin, gagawa ng ma- malaking building. Kasi yung pile driver mag... Uh, Reclaim the area yan eh. Malambot yung lupa dyan eh. And it will be subject to liquefaction kung magka-earthquake. So they will make sure na yung buildings na gagawin lang will stand on solid ground. No? Eh, the, uh, the only way to do it is mag-bound uh, ka ng pile dun sa kwan. Pag uh, nagpasok uh, sila ng mga pile driver dyan, equipment, no? then uh, kwan na tayo. Aha. Alagay ko, at katulad ng sinabi ni Atty. Domingo, marahil nararapat lamang na itaas na natin ang antas ng pakikibaka sa ganitong, sa ganitong pagkakataon. Maraming salamat po. Hindi ko na i-discuss yung ibang haba. <laughs> Alright. Um, thank you, uh, Sir Nori, for that synthesis. All right. So, on behalf of the UP College of Architecture um, and the Environmental Landscapes um, Studio Laboratory, uh, we would like to thank our partners, the Philippine Association of Landscape Architects, um, UP Circle of Landscape Architecture Students, the Research and Extension Office, UP Department of Philosophy, and the Philippine Bar Association. Thank you to our two distinguished reactors, Dr. Lumberto Mendoza and landscape architect Honorio Palarca. Thank you, Dean Grace, for opening our webinar tonight. Um, we would also like to extend uh, a special gratitude to our five panel experts, Attorney Rico Domingo, Dr. Philip Ian Padilla, Dr. Maria Stephanie Fay Cagayan, landscape architect Paolo Alcazarin, and Dr. Carmela Española. To our speakers, um, may we get a closing statement from each of you? Uh, maybe we could start with Attorney Rico. Attorney Rico Domingo, last statement, please, sir. Salamat uh, sa lahat ng mga organizers ng ating discussion. I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Mas marami pa tayong diskusyon na dapat uh, kampanin at uh, isama natin ang ating mga, mga kababata, isama natin ang ating mga kababayan na hindi nakakaalam ng matataas na English. Let's go down to their level. In fact, uh, frankly, if I may suggest, which we will do in the, in the future in our sure, future sir. webinars, Tagalogin natin. Kung hindi natin matatagalog, translate natin para sa mga tao. Because I think it's a high time for us to really heighten the consciousness, the national consciousness, and start a conversation on these burning issues that we are confronted with. Sabi nga ng ating, uh, again, nakalimutan ko mga pangalang because new citizen na ako. All right, sir. Kung magigiting nating mga reactors, eh, kailangan nating taasan ang antas ng pakikibaka ngayon. I think we need to do that right now. It's very timely. It's apolitical. Wala tayong political agenda dito, mga kababayan. Wala tayo, wala sa ating magra-run for any public office. Gusto lang natin malaman ng mga tao, anong nangyayari? 
kasi sila ay litong-lito na at napakaraming issues na naghahanging around, hindi nila maintindihan ang issues. I think we, it is our obligation as people, educators, ako eh, nagtuturo rin ako ng batas sa Ateneo Law, we, it's our obligation to tell the people what is happening around. Yun lang po. Thank you, Attorney Domingo. Thank you. Um, Dr. Philip Ian Padilla, please, sir. Uh, thank you, Franklin. Siguro ang masasabi ko lang talaga, i-emphasize ko lang yung sinabi din ni Dr. Rafe, yung system thinking, there needs to be a look, there needs to be a way for our policymakers to look at the system's point of view in addressing all the different parts of the system. If you only address one, you, you still fail. Uh, all the parts of the system works uh, in terms of furthering, in this case, uh, better uh, health outcomes. So, and my second message is that aside from systems thinking, uh, it takes a whole of society approach. All the necessary stakeholders need to have their opinions heard by the policymakers so that each and every one of us have a stake in whatever uh, endeavor we have, in this case, a mega vaccine facility. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Padilla. Dr. Cagayan, please. Uh, muli po, ako ay nagpapasalamat sa paanyaya na lumawag sa usaping ito. Uh, isa lang po masasabi ko, ang usaping pangkalusugan, ang usaping pangkalikasan ay, pa, ay usaping political po. So lahat po tayo ay uh, inaanyayahan makisali at uh, ilabas po ang ating tinig para marinig pa po ng mga nasa taas. Ayoko po makita yung ano po, drive, ano po yun? Yung, ano nga po yung machine na gagamitin? Uh, Sir Nori? Drive piler? Ano po ba yun? File driver. File driver, baliktad pa pala. Ayoko po yung makita dyan sa area na yan. Ako po ay uh, palaging paikot-ikot sa area po ng Manila and uh, kailangan pong lakasan pa natin ang boses natin at sana po ay simula pa lang ito ng maigting na pagsasama. No? Uh, I'm very, very happy to be included in this uh, group of people to be talking about a topic na pag inisip ko naman eh, bakit ba ako naimbitahan dito? Pero napakalaking uh, honor po para sa akin na makisali pa po dito sa usapin na ito. Again, maraming maraming salamat po at magandang gabi sa lahat. Thank you, Dr. Gagayan. Ma'am, be safe ha kung labas po kayo ng labas. <laughs> Ingat po tayo parate. <laughs> All right. Thank you po, Doc. Um, next, landscape architect Alcazarin, sir, please. Yes, Frank, thank you. Uh, I'd like to say uh, thank you. Maraming salamat sa organizers uh, for this opportunity to share. At uh, isang mensahe lang tungkol sa uh, Nayong Filipino Foundation. Uh, I think we can save the Nayong Filipino. It has a long history, 50 years. The only problem is it has overlaps with other institutions. So I would, I would like to see uh, the Nayong Filipino merge with the National Parks Development Committee and the Parks and Wildlife Bureau so that we can uh, establish a consolidated National Parks uh, uh, Bureau that will see to it that all of our towns and cities have uh, have parks and open spaces uh, that are accessible to all of our citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Landscape Park, Sir Paolo. Thank you, Po. Um, last but not the least, may we hear the closing statement from Dr. Espanola. Okay. Uh, maraming salamat ulit sa inyong paanyaya. Um, well, I speak for the birds. I speak for nature and I speak for... Um, all this habitat that will be lost if ever uh, anything permanent will be built in those lands no, sa na yung Pilipino na area. So I hope that uh, yung kapakanan ng mga tao at ng kalikasan ay isipin ng mga tao no, bago sila, uh, ng ating mga leaders, no, ng ating mga namumuno sa atin, bago nila gawin itong mga bagay na ito na development. No? Um, hindi ko alam yung, yung the ins and outs of politics. I'm, I'm just uh, a doctor of biology. Uh, so hindi ko naintindihan yun. Pero ang masasabi ko lang na itong mga ito, mga kakalikasan, they need to have a voice in this uh, debate. No? Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Dr. Carmela. All right, so thank you for all the points that you have shared with us to our panel speakers. Um, our gratitude also goes to our attendees who joined our live streaming through the Environmental Landscapes Studio Laboratory YouTube page and the various Facebook pages. Thank you, thank you to everyone who spent your Tuesday night with us. We hope to see you all again in the next webinars. Um, we, of course, we'll be planning more conversations like this. Um, so for tonight, this is uh, me um, saying good night to everyone. Keep healthy and safe. And let's all, maybe we could just catch up on dinner and let's all have a good night. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Thank sir. you everyone. Thank you. Rami, salamat. Thank you. Salamat.